To finish our look at collecting data, which is really what LO3 is all about, we're going to talk about how the data can be used in various different industries, various different sectors of the economy. So the examples I'm going to give throughout are my examples. You may want to come up with your own, you may have better examples than I do. Feel free to use whichever examples you want to in the exam. But the actual industries are set by the exam board. So first of all, how can it be used in law enforcement? So law enforcement include the government agencies who make sure legislation, so laws, are followed by people. So really by law enforcement, we tend to think just police, which they comprise the main body, the main agency which enforces laws, right? If you do something wrong, you get arrested. But also other agencies like the border force, at passport control and so on, the intelligence agencies, so MI5, MI6 and GCHQ. They're not as visible as the police, but they do still exist. And other agencies like the DVLA, Driver and Vehicle Licensing Agency. When you go and drive a car, you may not know much about it at the moment, but if you do drive a car in the future, you have to register and pass a test and give your details to the DVLA because they're in charge of making sure all vehicles and drivers are licensed properly. They all use data in lots of ways and certainly they'll be collecting data about what's going on, what incidents they're dealing with. So for, mo for the most part, crimes essentially, especially if you are the police. So what crimes occurred, when did they occur and so on, that is all data being collected. And also they care about what the effect was, You know, what was the penalty applied to that crime? Was it a fine, was it a jail sentence? They obviously care about the follow up, what happened to individuals. Now, the police and other agencies are not just one uniform body. They are divided into local areas, right? So there is a police force for London, for Manchester, for different counties. And the data they're going to collect for local data will be combined at some stage into a larger national database. So I've used the word or two words, data stores here. A data store is just a set of data sets. So multiple data sets that are related to the same thing. In this case, law enforcement. And all the individual local data stores, which may be small data, will combine into the larger national database, which may be considered big data. Now, there are lots of different examples we can give for law enforcement, but another good one is talking about AMPR. So AMPR stands for Automatic Number Plate Recognition, and this is in force in some CCTV cameras, especially ones on motorways, and also some police cars, not all police cars, but some police cars will have some cameras, usually on the roof, and the camera will have AMPR built in. So what this means is, this is from a camera on a motorway. As it, the name suggests, the cameras can automatically pick up any license plates, or number plates as we'd call it in England. So number plates can be picked up by the cameras, and because all, all because loads of data is being collected about vehicles, we can, or the software can cross check the license plate to see if it matches up with any crimes maybe, perhaps the vehicle has been registered stolen, it can flag that actually the vehicle with that number plate has been stolen and so the police can be alerted to it. And as an example of how different agencies can have their data stores interact, well the DVLA are a separate agency to the police. However, their data store is relevant to the police because they'll store data about if someone has insured their car, if someone has paid tax on their car, both things you need to do to be legal. And the police obviously care about that. They want to enforce people who are not insured and so on. So the AMPR can also be linked to the DVLA data store to have access to more data. Another area which uses data very heavily, especially nowadays, is education. So schools and universities primarily. So for example, as I'm sure you are aware, teachers record lots of assessment data about you every time you do a test. In all likelihood, that score is being recorded somewhere to keep track of progress and so on. The reading age of a pupil is really valuable to teachers because we can adapt our teaching to help people who maybe have a low reading age or stretch people who have a high reading age. And at primary school, various different bits of data can be used to calculate statistics. So this fry graph is a way you can estimate reading ages, not something I've had to do because I'm not a primary school teacher, but it is important data to collect. And thinking small and big data, right? So the data for a single pupil is obviously small data, even for a single year or a single school, that data set is still fairly small. At maximum, it's going to be, you know, most schools are maybe a thousand people, maybe 2000 if they're huge. 
But we can also combine the scores for the entire country, right? So if you want to make a comparison between how well people did in one year versus another year, you could combine the data from every single school in the country and make a nice comparison like this. That is having a small data set interact with a larger data set, maybe even a big data set, by just combining different data stores together. And in education, that is mostly to make comparisons to see how things are going. The health and fitness industry includes hospitals and doctors and gyms and general products which people use to work out and play sports. So hospitals can record lots of medical data. Hopefully you've never been in a situation where you've needed to, but doctors can record data about you, so your heart rate and various other metrics, which I don't understand as a non-doctor. And from this data, they can analyze it and decide on the right treatment. And also to monitor changes, maybe you're getting better. They can tell that from looking at the data potentially. On a similar theme, hopefully you are registered with your local GP, your local doctor. They are going to have lots of data about you, your medical history and just your personal information so they can contact you. If you move house, what should happen is your data should be moved from your old doctor to your new doctor. And so your new doctor will update their data store with this new data. So that's an example of how two different fairly small data stores will interact to merge if you need to move to a new doctor, for example. We've also talked in a previous video about wearable technology like fitness trackers. So these can collect lots of different useful data that can be used in this industry. So things like calories burned, your heart rate, how far you have run and various other things which can help you if you're trying to exercise, you can keep track of how well you are doing when you are running or cycling or so on. The data from a single fitness tracker is an example of small data, but maybe Fitbit can somehow combine all the data from all of them and can analyse this as big data. So the shopping industry includes both shops you see in person, like on the high street and also online. And clearly shops need to keep track of all products sold to ensure that if a product is sold, they eventually reorder it. So stock does not run out. You don't want to go to an empty supermarket. You want there to be enough products for you to buy. And they can do this using barcodes and maybe even a QR code and just keep track of it that way, as we've talked about. They can also use loyalty schemes to collect data about what their most loyal customers are buying and can use this data to analyze it to maybe target advertisements at a particular group of people potentially. And some shops will even go to fairly extreme lengths to try and maximize their profit through analyzing data. So some shops will get some customers to wear some eye tracking glasses, so glasses with a camera inside, an example of wearable technology, and see where they are looking as they buy their weekly shop, say. So you'll notice on shelves that often the cheapest products, maybe the own brand products, are right at the top or right at the bottom, and the expensive ones are in the middle. And that's not just because it seems logical, it's because the shop has trialed and saw where people are looking most. So the big blue circles here are the most where people look at the most and you can see where people are not looking at all and so it makes sense to put the most expensive products where people are looking to try and maximize profit so quite a lot of data being collected even just by one person or maybe a few people looking at various places in a store the technology can enable lots of data to be tracked and then analyzed the entertainment and leisure industry really comprises anything we do when we're not working or at school so one of the kind of sectors within this sector are the streaming services like Spotify and Netflix. And so what they'll do, they'll keep track of your histories, so what you have watched, what you have listened to, in order to produce recommendations. So they want you to keep to keep listening or keep watching. This is from Spotify, so it's music. They want you to keep using their product and so they'll recommend new songs and new maybe movies for you to watch. Here, this is my Spotify, it's recommended indie playlist for me, which is fairly accurate. I like indie music, it's analysed my histories to recommend the two playlists here. Also the number of views or listens that a product gets will often detect if it gets renewed. So maybe Netflix are producing one series of a show. If it is number one in the UK, because they can track the number of views, they might decide that actually it's worth them making a second series. Maybe it's not got many views and so they decide not to. So decisions can be made based on metrics like views and also maybe likes and dislikes. Now, Spotify and Netflix have many, many customers. They are producing an incredible amount of data on a daily basis. I mean, think about YouTube. YouTube also counts under this industry. Think how many videos there are, how many likes and dislikes, how many subscribers. 
that data is going to be stored somewhere. This is definitely big data. And so to produce recommendations, in all likelihood, they're going to filter that big data by various categories like age, location, and gender. Because otherwise, if they're trying to analyze what the entire world likes to watch, that is going to be too difficult. Okay, finally, let's look at the lifestyle industry. So in my eyes, at least, it's quite a general term. In my eyes, it encompasses what we get up to in our day-to-day -day lives. So social media could well be classed as entertainment or leisure, but in my view, at least, social media we deal with on our, you know, all the time. So the companies like Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, and so on, we use the way we interact with it, like our likes and favorites, to help show recommended posts and also encourage new follows. So you might get a new account on Instagram recommended because you have followed a few other people that follow that account. And so they make predictions based on your history. Again, millions and millions of people use for social media. The volume of data collected is absolutely huge. They will filter it down because otherwise it becomes unmanageable. In terms of maybe our houses and day-to-day -day surroundings, you might start to see more and more video doorbells in action where a video camera is linked to the doorbell and this can record movements outside of your house. So if you are particularly paranoid, this camera will be picking up every single movement outside of your house, which you can keep track of and also maybe access remotely. So if you are outside of your, if you are away from home and someone rings your doorbell, you can use the app on your phone to see who is at your door, which you may be, you may want. Another device which is maybe used a bit more frequently in homes, which also collects lots of data is a smart meter. So a meter is used to collect or to record how much electricity and also gas you have used in your house, you know, for the purposes of paying a bill. And smart meters have a processor and also have a internet connection and they can be used on an individual level, so for small data, to track in real time to see how much electricity you're using at a single moment. So you can see on a daily basis how much you are using, how much you are going to be paying which for an individual can help them budget, can help them maybe save energy, because if they are spending lots of money, they might want to start turning lights off and turning devices off and so on. But on a wider scale, the electricity companies can also record data from smart meters so they can record loads more data than they could beforehand on the old fashioned meters. And so all of this data can be combined across the millions of households and the company can make big decisions based on this big data. So really loads of small data stores nationwide are combined, are interacting to build up to a big data store that your company can use.